Welcome to the official tennis.com podcast featuring professional coach and community leader, Kamal Murray. Welcome to the tennis.com podcast. I'm your host, Kamal Murray, and we are here with the man. Well, let me not say the man, the voice, the myth, the voice of tennis and your favorite stops on tour, both home and abroad, the most coveted tennis event producer in the world, the person on tour that probably makes the players win or lose, feel most comfortable when he walks out on the court with his microphone, hoping not to make them cry more than they already want to. The dude that goes to refill his plate at breakfast four times <laughs> before the matches start. <laughs> Andrew Krasny, welcome to the show. Hey, Kamal, thank you. You know, it's funny, everything that you said was a lot of fluff, but one that meant a lot to me was that maybe my voice does bring some comfort when a player walks out on a court that actually really touched me. So, so I, I think that was pretty cool. So thank you. Well, you know, I will say, when you hear your voice, you know two things. A, it's a big time event. And B, the promoter spent a lot of cash. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you've written me a check. But I listen, I do 250s, 500s, 1000s. I look, you know, Joan Rivers taught me early in my career that if your week is open on your calendar and someone's willing to pay you, you got to say, you can't say no to anybody. But uh, it does of late, I guess you can say, I think it was in Chicago, one of your events, someone walked up to me from the WTA and they're like, wow, Kamal brought in the big guns. I'm like, no, Kamal, I can't say no to Kamal no matter what. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so you brought up Joan Rivers, right? And, and when you look at your career, you know, when you when you hang out with us tennis players, you're kind of slumming it because you're used to big Hollywood, Joan Rivers, Martin Short. Tell us about those days. Obviously, we all want we all want a good Joan Rivers story. Well, it's funny. There's, first of all, you'd have to have a three hour show if you wanted uh, good Joan Rivers stories, which I'll give you a couple. But, you know, early in my career, when I was in my late 20s, I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to do, but I knew I wanted to be in front of people, but you can't just wake up in the morning and decide you wanna be a performer and, and be successful at it. So I started producing on talk shows, was working with uh, Lisa Gibbons, who I uh, just, we just had a big reunion a couple of weeks ago. I was a producer on a talk show with Lisa Gibbons and, and being a sensitive guy, believe it or not, behind all my sarcasm, <laughs> I was always producing the, the sensitive shows, uh, cancer topics or missing children. It was a, a talk show back in the 90s and uh, took a lot of work home with me. And I wasn't sure that I wanted to go down that path in my career. And I uh, was watching our warm up guy one day, uh, the guy who comes out to warm up an audience before a TV show starts and uh, knew right then and there that that was my calling at the time and uh, approached Lisa during our Christmas hiatus and asked her if I could be the warm up guy instead of produce. She thought I was crazy, but she's like, if that's what you wanna do, go for it. And that was the beginning in my late twenties of being in front of an audience and, uh, and, and understanding that you can be in front of an audience and at the same time, not make it all about you, right? Cause you want to be a warm up guy, but you never, you never want to outshine the star of the show. And it's the same 30 years, 25, 30 years later in my tennis career where I want to have fun. I want to have the microphone, but I never want to make it bigger uh, than the players. It's all about the players to me and the fans. So how did you transition from that to tennis, right? Because I always am amazed. Well, obviously we, we talk about how small of a, a, like a circle and like a tight knit group and like family that tennis is. And it is so hard to penetrate and to sort of get in this family, right? right. And how did you penetrate this market coming from John Rivers and Martin Short? Well, it, it wasn't and being a mediocre tennis player. Sorry, no. Okay. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm an average. I'm for USTA rankings and stuff. I'm a four or five, uh, maybe on my best day doubles in five, like a five zero. but you probably don't know what that is because that's like civilian lingo. I, I actually know what a four or five is. And I think you just gave yourself a one point inflation. No, really true four or five. <laughs> honest. But the older I get, you know, you spend your whole life trying to get to a number 
and then and then you get there and then all you want to do is go back down so you can finally win some matches but, <laughs> but so to make a long story short i was producing on a talk show for martin short and uh, went on an audition and got a job hosting a dating show on the usa network it was called crush it was 20 years ago and uh got finally got my own show hosted that for a season that show got canceled after a season and i had just started playing tennis competitively on a civilian level and uh, was at a tennis tournament at UCLA. Bob Kramer put on a great event at UCLA and a friend of mine worked for Bob Kramer. And I remember sitting there with a group of friends watching this match come out and it was Andre Agassi. And this guy was like in his eighties introduced Andre Agassi. And I looked down at the court and I said, that's the job I want to do. I want to interview tennis players. I want to welcome crowds. I want to entertain crowds between matches. I want to be that warm-up guy, but I want to apply it to tennis. And uh, Bob Kramer gave me an opportunity. I was uh, also writing a radio show and producing a radio show with Joan Rivers. She gave me a week off with pay. That's the kind of woman Joan Rivers was because she knew I wanted to find my passion. And uh, I volunteered at Bob Kramer's tournament on a side court for a couple of years. And I could have died right there a happy man because here I am. I'm 30 years old, I'm uh, in my 30s, I'm watching Andre Agassi, Pete Sampras, I'm getting free clothes, I'm interviewing them, I'm getting free coupons to go to California Pizza Kitchen. I mean, I was the happiest guy and I was getting paid by Joan Rivers to work for Bob Kramer for free. And long story short, that turned into a tournament in Carson, that turned into a tournament in Amelia Island, that turned into La Costa, turned into the WTA Finals, turned into Indian Wells, Miami and it exploded and became almost a full-time job until about seven or eight years ago uh, where tennis became full-time. I started to uh, produce some of the events that I'm involved with. So what do we have to do to go back to the free t-shirt and free California pizza kitchen coupons to get you to work an event? I mean, I, I want to go back to those days. So that was, I mean, listen, to be able to, st listen, we all want to find a career that we're passionate about. And I talk to kids now about finding something that you can't just say you want to do something. You've got to, in any sport or any profession, you've got to really want to do it. You've got to eat, drink, and, and, and sleep it, everything, right? It's got to be what courses blood through your veins. And tennis was that for me. I was a super fan. I would go to watch Arantxa play. I would go to watch Monica play, Pete Sampras, Andre Agassi, Pat Rafter. I was watching them all play tennis. And when I saw a slight crack in a door open where I could possibly incorporate that into my career, I ran through that door and uh, it didn't happen overnight. The, you know, each tournament grew into more tournaments and trust also doesn't happen overnight. As you say, you, you know, to penetrate that, that circle, you have to show respect. You have to understand the sport. You have to uh, understand personalities and egos. I mean, it's a very complex aspect of a sport that a lot of people don't realize, but I think the, what players expect the most from someone in my position is to understand the match, what occurred, how they won the match, understand their accomplishments and their accolades and respecting that you're gonna always ask them a question that's never gonna put them on the spot. And, and my job is to present players in the best possible light that I can do. So tell me about a time, your favorite interview, because you've obviously had the opportunity to interview the greatest players in a manner that most don't get to because of your trust level, right? So, you know, we see Serena win a match and we see you walk on with the microphone and we see her smile, right? right. Uh, and we don't get that too often, right? You can tell that there's a comfortability there between you and Serena Maria. Tell us about, tell us about one of your most favorite interviews. Well, that, that warms my heart that you notice the smile that players have when they walk on the court. You know, I could write a book maybe I will one day about when my relationship with each player that I've worked with in 20 years went from just being a colleague to maybe a little bit of a, of a friend or someone that they can trust. I think there was a moment with each player individually that I could say happened in order to make that transition to where that we had a trusting back and forth reciprocal friendship. Uh, Serena, back in the day, believe it or not, I was so new in my career, Kamal, that I didn't even put two and two together. And I was introducing 
she was warming up with a player. I couldn't even tell you who it was. It was in Carson, California, brand new in my career. And I'm inter introducing the, the player she's warming up against. And in her bio, the opponent, I mentioned that she had beaten Venus, which was a rookie mistake. Now I would take that out, right? I would never, but I just was reading. I didn't, I didn't even write the bio. I think someone wrote it and I didn't, I didn't catch it. And I said it and I got a look from Serena like, <laughs> I'm going to cut you. It was like, <laughs> like you could see through the fog. And, uh, and after that match, I said, Serena, I, I owe you an apology. And it was rookie of me. And she's like, oh, I heard that. I said, well, what can I do? And she goes, well, I like teddy bears. And I went out and bought her a teddy bear. <laughs> Brought it to her the next day and said, I owe you an apology. I should never have done that. And she laughed. It, it, I would tell you that there's moments there's just things that have happened in the past, right? You know, when Serena, do you remember when Serena got ejected from the US Open? Uh, there was a lot of hate and I felt bad for her because I felt that people want to cancel you and judge you by a, a moment of, of, of misjudgment or a lapse in judgment. And I made t-shirts and wore them at my tennis club and said, free Serena. I made, tea. I, I was teaching a hosting class in LA I had a student that made t-shirts and I made them free Serena. I wore them to my tennis club, wore them everywhere. And, and of course I told Renee Stubbs and Renee Stubbs who will tell you if she comes on your show that she cannot keep a secret. She went and told Serena <laughs> and Serena comes up to me in Doha and says, I heard you made a t-shirt that says my name on like, what, what's that about? And uh, I gave her one. And that was another big moment where she felt that maybe there's someone on, on her side who works in our position. And I felt bad for her. And mm -hmm. that was, uh, gosh, how many years ago? 12, 13 years ago, 14 years ago. So like there's moments, uh, you know, interview, there's been moments in my career where I feel very blessed to do what I do. Kim Kleisters had given her last interview at, at the time at the US Open. She was playing doubles with one of the Bryan brothers. I interviewed her. When I realized it was her last match, I had tears running down my face. Uh, which I think made her realize uh, that she's played a significant part in my life. And when you grow those relationships with these players, we spend a lot more time together behind the scenes than we do in front of the scenes, as you know. And we travel together, we fly together, we see each other in airport lounges, we see each other at breakfast, uh, we spend hours on rainy days that uh, we have relationships that I think deserve maintenance and deserve trust and loyalty. So you mentioned breakfast. What's your favorite breakfast spot? I always ask people, what's their favorite stop on tour? You're obviously conflicted because you're going to say a place that employs you, like Indian Wells, Miami, those kind of places. So I don't want to ask a question, but what's your, I swear, every time at breakfast, you spend there for three hours and you get four plates, no. but you stay skinny. So what's You're your lying. favorite hotel where you go back for that free breakfast buffet? Well, we had First of all, it's not free, right? Someone's paying for it. The but tournament's paying for it. Because in Guadalajara, we had a late start and uh, we usually worked late at night. So you get up early in the morning at a beautiful hotel like we were in in Guadalajara and you and I would see each other going back and forth to the buffet. By the way, you had to be there to see me there for three hours. So, uh, <laughs> But I, you know, in Guadalajara was so funny. I ordered guacamole and didn't realize that it came with uh, grasshoppers in it, uh, which freaked me out. Oh, yeah. yeah. Gross. Grasshoppers in my guacamole. Gross. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I love to, listen, we have, we're very lucky. Uh, some of the tournaments that I work for give me a hard time that I want to stay at nicer hotels. Uh, I don't love to travel. So in order to travel, I, I want to be as comfortable as I can be so I can deliver the best in, in, that I have in me. So I do get lucky and very blessed to stay at nice hotels where I can run into people like you at breakfast who like to out me. On, uh, <laughs> on podcasts uh, about how much time I like to spend at breakfast. Well, if I notice how many times you go to breakfast over a week long, that means it was a good week. That means I was also there. Right. So, all the way through to the final because all the way to the final. won Guadalajara. Who, let me just out you one more time. <laughs> You're in charge of the event. And this, this, this brings me to my next question. You're in charge right. of the event. Luckily, it wasn't a crucial moment. I think it was like two one and the music comes on in the middle of the point. 
Luckily, it was on Booz Kova serve. Okay. And I was like, Andrew, what the hell? Okay. Well, I'm going to be the first to tell you that there uh, are times where that's my fault and times where it's not. Luckily, 99% of the time, it's not. But Guadalajara, <laughs> when this happened, I was not producing that event. I was just the host. And somebody up in a booth pushed the wrong button. But I will tell you, in Miami, this last spring, somebody was testing a commercial that I was voiceover. Uh, I did the voiceover for, and it's in the middle of a Medvedev match. And the commercial comes on, just, just the sound. And whose voice is it but mine? And, uh, you know, Daniil's agent, Ollie comes up to me and says, smooth move, Andrew. I'm like, I swear it wasn't me. He goes, it was your voice. I'm like, but it wasn't me. But I will tell you in Indian Wells one year, Kamal, I had a microphone under my arm and a volunteer had dropped a stack of paper and I bent down to help her. And I'm like, here, let me help you. The microphone turned on and Caroline Wozniacki is going to serve in front of 13,000 people. And my voice comes on saying, here, let me help you. <laughs> and she catches the ball and looks around like, did Andrew just did Andrew <laughs> say, let me help you <laughs> around? And uh, yeah, it was me. It was my microphone. So now most of my sound guys mute me whenever possible, but we make mistakes. You know, that <laughs> we're, we're human beings and a, a DJ will think he's testing something and he won't push the right mute button and it'll go out in the middle of a match. Have you, has it ever happened in your career? where it's cost the server the game. Okay, which, so- Which consequently my, can cost the match. Okay, so my biggest fear in the whole world is that a mistake that I will make or someone on my team will make and that the match would sway in the other direction and then the player will go to press and bring it up. That's been my biggest fear in my entire career. And by the grace of God, knock on wood, that's never happened. So like I introduced Novak Djokovic from being from Belgium instead of Belgrade, you know, 18 years ago. And he caught threw a tennis ball at me and hit me. I'm like, oh my God, please win the match. So it never comes up again. Please win the match. And he won the match. So that's never happened. So I remember um, the first time I really sort of got to know you was Montreal 2018. Were there all week? Not Montreal. When was it? It had to have been another city because I've never done Montreal. Miami 2018. Miami, okay. Miami 2018. Were we still at on Key Biscayne? We were still at Crandon Park. Okay. Key Biscayne, all the way to the end, won the tournament. And by the end of the tournament, I'm like, okay, I can almost recite this playlist <laughs> by heart. <laughs> Who chose this music? Like, it could not have been more white. So tell me how you choose the music because the sport's getting younger, Andrew. So right. is the music for the players or is the music for the fans? Okay, so I will probably get in trouble for saying this, but an event that I'm, first of all, you want a nice mix where the play, where the music is for everybody. But my music that I choose, and I do, I have a horrible taste in music, but I am, you know, we have to keep it as clean as possible. We can't have any questionable lyrics. My music is 99.9% .9 directed towards our fans. If I know a song that a player loves and some tournaments we've had asked players to give us their requests, we'll play it in their warm up. But generally we try and play music that extends across generations that just makes people smile and make them happy. And I will, beg to differ with you that my music is as Blanco as you say it is, <laughs> but um, now you're making me <laughs> go take a look at my, uh, at my iPod, which by the way, I left in Chicago and, and it was held for ransom, <laughs> but I got it back finally. No, I try and keep until they Until they plugged it in and listened to the music and said, okay, old man from Palm Springs, you can have it back. <laughs> right. I, but listen, wait, listen, first of all, I don't play the music that I love. I play, listen, I play stuff that from the Bee Gees to Bruno Mars to 70s music, 80s, 90s music. I agree with you 
uh, like my volley, I probably need to work on my selection of music, but I have to be really careful because, you know, it, the minute I let my guard down, Kamal, there's questionable lyrics and I get letters that complain about me or a chair umpire, a, a line judge who will remain nameless came up to me and said, I've got this great song. And she gave me a memory stick and I plugged it into my computer and I played it. And you know, the song that's like, I think it goes, I want to be a millionaire. So bleeping bad. You remember that song? Uh-huh. Okay, so she gave me the X-rated version of it, and I just <laughs> and I played it, and it's like I want to be a billionaire, so effing bad. Went out to twenty five hundred people in in San Jose, and I got in trouble. Or Bruno Mars has a couple songs that says uh, like lonely ass B words, and I got to take that out. I can't play that kind of stuff, so I've got to be very very bubblegum. Now the the good the good ones are when you see the player on change over kind of swaying a little bit, right. win or That's lose. I'm like, okay, now you hit the mark. But I do think it's an important role because sometimes, you know, the changeovers, the bathroom breaks, which we're seeing a lot more of, right. the injury timeouts, you have a key role in entertaining the crowd, right? Um, and your music selection has to sort of speak to that. Now let me ask you this because. Some, you know, now that I'm sort of on the other side of the camera, you always wonder like, hmm, it's five, six. Maybe we shouldn't go to commercial. Right. Maybe we should stay on it. Right. Right. And watch the player on the changeover, watch their expression, watch whether they pull out their notebook, watch the fan experience, right? Like, um, you know, when Delpo plays, you can see the fans like go crazy on the changeover and that becomes part of the story. Exactly. Or like French Open 2018 when the crowd is saying, see, Mo or not, right? That, that kind of thing. Um, those are moments where you don't want to go to commercial and what you do get, gets put on front stage. Do you feel like we need to be more strategic and when we go to commercial, when we should let the experience play out in front of us? Right. Well, listen, it's, some of that's not in my control, right? I can't control what what Ross Schneiderman or my, my big bosses at Tennis Channel do. If they have to go to- Shout out to the big bosses. They got to go out to commercial, they got to go out to commercial. But what I can control is what happens on inside the stadium. And, you know, fortunately I work with the best show caller in, in the business, you know, Todd Noonan, Patty Jacobson, and they're in the moment. They understand what's going on. So if, if the, you know, Roger Federer is about to get bounced out of the tournament and, if he breaks, he stays in. We're not going to play Sweet Caroline in the changeover. We're not going to run a, uh, you know, a feminine hygiene commercial and, and everybody be like, what the heck are you thinking? We'll pull the commercial. We'll play a good song. We'll play like Eye of the Tiger or this, this girl is on fire. Like we'll play something that, and I'm, listen, I have a horrible taste in music. And you will say, it's the smaller events where you can bag on my music. Indian Wells in Miami, we've got professional DJs now who are playing majorly cool music. Uh, man, we can't let them do DJ drops and stuff like that, which I didn't know what a DJ drop was until about a year and a half ago. I remember. You remember? Uh, <laughs> but we, we do really try our hardest to match the moment. And you know, I think, to tell you the truth, Kamal, there's nowhere else in the world that I would rather be than at the tournament that I'm working at. And, and I try my hardest to make sure that everybody who's in our stadium realizes uh, and understands that that's what we're doing for them. Because I believe that everyone who's there who spent all that money to watch Rafa play or Simona or Sloan or Maria or Serena, they've spent a lot of their hard earned money and they could be watching it at home very easily. And I want to make sure that I've given them everything that they they deserve. So you've obviously had a chance to be courtside for a lot of tennis, right? Men's and women's, great matches. And sometimes, you know, you're oblivious that you're really watching history. And sometimes right. you're not. I remember 2018, Montreal final. Sloan was playing Simona Hallett. And I was sitting there with Othman, who's, you know, uh, co-coaching with me. Sloan, and I sat back next to him and I said, this is the best. I said, win or lose, this is the best match, women's match of the year. They are going at it, right? So tell us about the most historic match that you've been a part of. And you were like aware, like, damn, I'm watching history. 
Well, there's a few, right? And I, th these are the moments where I wish I was almost savant like, like you take a look at Joel Drucker who can tell you every match and every historic moment in the last 30 years. Uh, the significant moments for me, uh, there was a big match, you know, Victoria Azarenka playing Paula Bedosa at Indian Wells was an epic final where we thought we were seeing, you hear it on the men's side a lot, but you don't always hear it on the women's where someone says, that's the best women's match I've ever seen. That's the best match I've seen of the season. Uh, I think the Venus and Serena matches have been epic because you know that they're so rare. Uh, but to me, the most historic moment for me on court, hands down in my entire career was uh, Serena's return to Indian Wells. Uh, she walked out on that. You, you know, I was not there when the first incident occurred, uh, but I was there for the entire boycott. Mm. So here I am, a huge fan of Serena's, uh, love her to death. And one of my favorite tournaments in the whole world, she wants nothing to do with. And it was a very sensitive area for me. Um, I almost never wanted to talk to her about Indian Wells because if I knew I knew how she felt. So when the deal was brokered, uh, and I use that as a facetious term, when the deal was brokered, however it went down, uh, to get Serena to, to look beyond and to make her way back to Indian Wells, uh, when she walked out on court and I introduced her, uh, I was a, uh, I was reduced to a puddle of tears. I, I looked at Isha, her sister, uh, and we sobbed. And it was to me one of the most significant moments, whether she won or lost the match. And she almost lost the match. She was playing Monica Nicolescu, who can drive the most sane person completely insane by just one shot of the ball on each side. Right? Uh, it was windy, and Serena had her work cut out for her. But uh, Serena coming back to Indian Wells and allowing all of us who love her to show her that love to me was the biggest, one of the most, if not the most moving moments of my career. Mm. So you've also been uh, public about struggle with anxiety and like mental health is sort of like, is a humongous thing amongst tennis players, especially, right? Because, you know, you walk out onto the court, it's only you, right? And sometimes you wish you could like crawl under the player bench and hide, right? And there literally is no place to hide once a player steps out onto that court, right? right. Um, tell us about sort of your struggle with anxiety. Um, does it come during events? Are you like, oh, shit, I gotta like make sure I get this right. Like, tell us about <laughs> where, where it comes out and how you and how you see it now evolving into a sport. Because I feel like every tournament, we can pick out a player who had a major opportunity or a major meltdown, and it was because maybe having a panic attack or an anxiety attack on the court. Uh, and now before we would say a player choked and now it's coming out that they're, they're more comfortable saying I had a panic attack or I had an anxiety attack. Well, first of all, I think it's incredible that we can be on a platform like this and talk about mental illness, which to me, uh, five years ago, six years ago, we, we weren't doing right. So it's important that we all talk about it and, uh, my personal battle was over the last 10, 15, 20 years where I've suffered from anxiety. Luckily for me, it never, it never happened. It never happens while I'm on court. It never happens when I'm working. Usually my anxieties were leaving home uh, and on you know, the journey of getting somewhere to me was rough. Once I was there for a couple of days, I was fine. But I have to give a lot of credit to, to Marty Fish who, uh, when I read his, you know, his op-ed about uh, his struggles and his battles, uh, made me feel a lot less, uh, a lot less unusual, right? It made me feel that I'm not the only one in the world. And you, no, listen, nobody wants to struggle with a disease. No one wants to struggle with uh, anything in life that we that we can't overcome. And how it manifests itself into each of us are very, very different. So in the you know, there's a very fine line between choking a match because you were anxious and then saying that you had an anxiety attack and to each individual, an anxiety attack is different to each individual. What constitutes the real true definition of an anxiety attack is if you're completely crippled and can't get up, can't get out of bed, don't want to leave. Uh, there are different levels of anxiety attacks and I'm not in any position to classify them for you at all. I do have to say it's it's interesting now to see how players feel 
it's safe to be able to discuss them. And obviously Naomi is the one who comes the most to the forefront when I think about Naomi Osaka, who I'm, I'm a huge fan of, and it kills me to see that she's been struggling in the last couple of years. But on another hand, uh, it would be a lot worse for her if she wasn't able to express herself. It's those of us who can't express ourselves and talk about it where it kills us inside and can cause serious damage. And the fact that players are being vocal and articulate about it, I have to give them kudos. And I do hope that, that there aren't players out there who will use it as an excuse uh, and that they'll be honest about it. But I don't really think that too many players are out there using it as a crutch or as an excuse because nobody wants to make up that they are suffering from an ailment or a disease. Uh, it's a pretty serious issue. And I'm just happy that we can all talk about it and not feel the shame. You know, We have this stigma in society that you can't talk about mental illness, but we can talk about having a headache and taking Advil. We can talk about having acid reflux and taking uh, Zantax, right? But we can't necessarily talk about medication that has to do with mental illness because we have this stigma in society that it means you're weak or that there's something wrong with you. To me, it just means that you might be wired different. And if there's a medication that helps untangle your wires, then why not take it? Well, I, I think that now, um anxiety or even just emotion is a humongous part of coaching, right? And you look at some of people's performances in Grand Slam finals that are so abnormal from what you saw with them in the previous six matches to get to the final. Right. And you know, it was like, mm, you know, I've, I've obviously coached somebody in two slam finals and the number one job even bigger than the X's and O's, right? Because if you get to the if you get to the seventh match, which I always say you got to win seven matches, right? Mm -hmm. When you get to the seventh match, you clearly are hitting the ball well enough mm -hmm. to be there. Mm -hmm. You clearly can sort of have a feel for the entire uh, court that day, but you may not have a feel for just the emotion involved in that day. And I think the biggest thing, or the, when I look at some of these slam finals, and I see one and two, two and two, three and one. You know, in some of these scores, you look like they didn't coach the emotions, right? And sort of the feeling of what it's going to feel like on that day. And it's probably too much time on the X's and O's. Right. And it goes on both sides, right? Not coaching the emotion, the player not being honest and vulnerable and saying, hey, guys, I'm scared, right? right. You know what I mean? And I think when you look that, that I think is a bigger part of coaching the game now than ever before. Is just saying, all right, strategically, here's what you got to do, right? But then even more than that, you spend 10 minutes on that, and then the rest of the evening before the match and the morning of the match is talking about how you're going to feel or when you feel this, do this, right? You know what I mean? And how to plan for that emotion that's going to come out. So, And that could be dealing with potential panic attack or dealing with anxiety with finishing a match, right? Being up 5-2 serving knowing this is going to be your first slam or whatever it is. I mean, the anxiety of having a false expectation appearing real, I call right. it fear, right? Right, can cripple somebody, right? And I think before it was just, oh, they just choked in the final. It was like, mm, the emotions weren't coached. Right. Well, it's interesting when you talk about how do you, how are you passionate or how can you be the most passionate about a sport where you're not supposed to be emotional, right? Or you, you take a look at what happened with, with Coco and Iga at the end of the match. First of all, my heart broke for Coco. I don't think anybody, no matter how strong they are, could have done any damage against Iga Shvantuk right now. It's spectacular to see the, it's like a, there's a feather in her hand. The way that racket moves and the way she has full understanding of the moment, it's spectacular to watch her. And she's an incredible kid. And then to watch Coco, what happened today, it was heartbreaking. I don't think she choked the match away. I think that Iga Svantec played a level above her. But my point is getting to the trophy presentation, Coco let her emotions out. You looked at her dad, her dad was crying. Iga started crying and Iga said, I told Coco not to cry and here I am crying. So I, I think that we need to allow ourselves to express ourselves emotionally and we need to embrace it. And it's okay to cry and it's okay to admit that you have anxieties and part of her training regimen and part of all these players, I mean, I'm not a coach come out and I've had the privilege of watching you coach and watching a lot of coaches uh, working on mental strength is as important 
as working on your forehand and your fitness and your overheads and and your all the things that you work on. I think that mental health has to be up there as an equal, equally as important to the things that you work on physically. And I think that that's obviously something that's been done with Iga. She travels with a full-time psychologist, which is incredible. I would, I should, I should be traveling with a full-time psychologist. Hey, if, if, if one more song comes on in the middle of my player's match, you're gonna need a therapist. You're gonna Ooh. need- that's rough, but I will say it's interesting. Did you see the look I gave you when it happened? I, I was like, I know, but that's <laughs> what's funny because the the earlier parts of my career, I was responsible for all of that. So now I could be in a match, and the music comes on, and Roger Federer is playing. And he'll look right at me like, "What happened, Andrew?" I'm like, "Rob, I had nothing. It's not me. I swear." And he goes, "I don't care. Go fix it." So it's uh, you never want that to happen. But anyhow, I have to say back to to mental health is I'm really glad. That, uh, that it's out in the forefront and people aren't are afraid to talk about it. I think the biggest enemy in the world right now for all of us, and I know it's making a lot of people wealthy and I know it's helping a lot of people on, on, on the platform that we're on right now to become more successful, but I think that social media is a, a huge culprit. And you take a look back on the days of Arancha and Steffi, not that I wanna sound old or feel old, but Lindsay and, like, what were they doing, Kamal, when they when they were finished with their matches, when they won or they lost it? I mean, they weren't going back to the locker room and sifting through a stack of 17 newspapers, were they? Mm -hmm. Right? There was no internet, there was no social media. So when I hear that people are keeping Carlos away from social media, I'm like, hell yeah. I think that's the best thing I've heard in five years. Yeah, I, I think when you, you know, when you when you check the draw, and you feel like you've got a good opportunity to win this tournament and thing, or even if you make it to the second week and it's a whole new tournament mm -hmm. and we just need to not screw it up for the next three or four matches. Yep. That's when for me as a coach, I started to say, all right, new rule, no social media, because the conversation can change a mindset. Right. Right. And winning a slam is all about mindset, especially from the second week on. And when you open up that phone and you got, a million followers or 200,000 followers. Okay. You have the opportunity to have a conversation, even if it's one way, right? right? With 200,000 people and 100,000 of it is going to be negative. Right. And that does not help what we're trying to accomplish. Or how about, how about Kamal if one is wrong? For example, yeah. with, with what happened with Naomi in March out at Indian Wells, one person's voice sent, said something that sent her off. And the way that I chose to handle it uh, on social media the next day, I had maybe 500 compliments and one, someone went off on me and that affected my, my day or my day and a half. And that's where I decided, you know what? I, I'm not looking at Instagram anymore because that, that one voice can be the voice that gets you. And that one voice can be the one that costs you a tournament. So you're absolutely right. But then that raises a question the more successful a player becomes, the more famous a player becomes, the more powerful they become. Who wants to say no to them? Who's afraid to say no to them? And you look at that whole, that's a big issue. So how do you tell someone like Naomi to not look at her phone? And then well, here's the thing. I think that, yes, the player is the boss because the player pays you. Right. However, for these two weeks, I'm the boss, right? You're the CEO and like your team is the board of directors, okay, right? And the board of directors can fire the CEO, right? They kind of tell the CEO, here's what needs to happen. And when the team around the player is on the same page, then the player doesn't have an opportunity to really go against it. Right. It's when the physio, the trainer, the therapist, the coach are all on different pages and one person mm -hmm. is trying to secure their job and be the friend or be the soft place for that player. That's when you start to get, okay, we're not gonna win because everybody's gotta be on the same page. And I think that, um, you know, coaches win when the players win, right? We want bonus, right? Right. Those bonuses get bigger in the second week. And so right. I'm gonna tell you nothing that is gonna hurt you nor me, right? Cause right. when you win, I win. And I think that those players who have these magical runs, which let's be honest, in this day and age, there aren't a lot of players who are winning multiple slams other than Osaka, Barty, now Swiatek. But everybody else is like one slam, 
then another one in a couple of years. And when they relinquish control, mm -hmm. then I think they're at their best. I and it's you. kind of like, you know, the coach has to look at the, and especially for players who don't look at the draw. You get the draw. You see the line of a players or the matchups, or even after the first round, when half the seeds start losing. That's when the coach goes to the player and says, all right, you don't look at the draw, but we got a good opportunity. We just can't screw it up, right? right, right. So here's what we're going to do, right? And when the player gives up that control, then I think you see these runs that become really magical. And I think that as these champions start to get younger and younger and younger, they're going to have to start relinquishing control, especially as it relates to what enters their mind, right? right. Um, and, you know, I always like to say, I've been your age before. You haven't been my age. Right. And so at the end of the day, just trust that I'm here for you. See, I think that's, that's fascinating to hear. And it's, uh, you can see that, right? In, in the two players that we're all talking about now, the most, right? Are Iga and Carlos. And you can see that clearly that's happening. And, uh, and it's spectacular to see. And, it's and, so even, and even you have sponsor obligations. But for these two weeks, I will call this sponsor. I will call that sponsor and say, no poster after the tournament because nobody wins if you don't win, right? And if you do win, then those, those you know, every one match, the followers go up 10% or 20%, right? So that one post that you want me to post on Wednesday or Thursday, if you wait till Monday mm -hmm. after the tournament, it'll have 20% greater value, right? It'll have more meaning, bigger platform because at the end of the two weeks, two people get the microphone. Champion right. in the finals, right. right? And so that's sort of what I think everyone has to get on board with because it's gotta, we got to become a better balance between allowing hundreds of thousands of people to have conversations with our players right. when they go to their hotel room at night, right? right? Over social media. Um, and then getting to the win and protecting their mindset. You know what I mean? Because it, it's, just, it's just amazing. And we've got to, players got to understand how important that the mental part of it is. And Iga clearly has figured it out. Right. That she's, and if you look at the way she's playing, Andrew, she's playing so fast, like just the time in the matches. She's playing so fast. It's almost like she's not giving herself time to think. Right. Time to panic and time to get nervous. But that's interesting because Kamal, I've noticed that when you've suffered from anxiety, it takes time to suffer from anxiety. When we, at least for me, I can't speak about anybody else's issues, but when I get down on myself or if I've gone through it and I've, and, and I've overcome a, a bad issue of anxiety years ago, but it's when I have the time to do it, right? It's uh, when you're not keeping yourself active, you're not exercising, you're not out doing things. You asked me earlier, I think before we got on, on our call or even during, the, during our chat is, did anxiety ever affect me? It never affects me while I'm working because I don't have time. Mm -hmm. It's when we're by ourselves or when we're not being constructive, we're not being creative, that that the little space between our ears tends to play games and tricks on ourselves where we have to keep a firm grasp on that, so to speak. So I think that that managing a player's time, man, you know, I've known from day one, long before social media, that I would never text a player during a Grand Slam or during a tournament. That's like their coveted time. I don't want to get into to Sloan's head and tell her that I love that outfit she was wearing. I'm not gonna, I don't wanna get into her head <laughs> during that, during that day. <laughs> my favorite story about, my favorite story about Sloan ever made me think of that as I ran in, I think you were there, we were at a hotel in New York and I looked at her, I was like, you look so good today. And she looked right back at me and she goes, I know. <laughs> and, and Sybil, her mom looks back at me, she's like, I don't know who she got that from. I'm like, really? <laughs> uh, she's funny. So I, listen, you just have to, I think players do need, and, and teams need to understand that we need to respect everyone's space. And uh, like I said, social media to me, I think is one of the greatest inventions of all time, but I also think it's, it's like alcohol, right? Like alcohol is great to have a little drink and get a little buzz maybe, but it's also one of the worst thing that's ever happened to mankind. And I think that social media is the same thing. It's just as dangerous. Well, let me ask you this. The start of a new year is always dangerous for you because you change your hair color. <laughs> Since I've known you, you've had five or six different hair colors. No, that's not true. So 
What's your favorite hair color? <laughs> First of all, uh, I, oh God. I know, you, I know you're trying to like find the fountain of youth, right? And see which one makes you look no, younger and thinner. Not a, this is not a hair color, Kamal. This is 100% 57-year-old Jew. Right. That's, that's the name on the bottle. Uh, I've had gray hair since I was in college, okay? And when you're 21 years old or 22, you're not digging having gray hair. If I could go back in my life, I wouldn't have cared, but I cared. So for years, I was messing around and putting color in my hair. No one knew because I was young. So in the last couple of years, as I'm getting older, it's been harder and harder. And I just, after the WTA finals in Guadalajara last year, I said, uh, I'm never going to worry about what my hair looks like again, as long as I live. And it took three months to get 30 years of crud out of my hair. And this is all I got left. So thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, you know, we're friends. So I got to be honest, you know, no, I love my, my least favorite was the jet black. It was never jet black. It might have looked jet black because it was a little too brown. Right. But it was never jet black. But I have to tell you, it was one of the most liberating things I've ever done. I have a T-shirt that says openly gray. <laughs> so uh, thank you for noticing. Uh, uh, everyone in the family loves it. And I've gotten some letters from some fans, uh, tennis fans. I don't like to say that I have fans because it's really not my show at all what I'm doing. I'm the luckiest guy in the whole world. But fans of our sport have reached out on social media and said, we're digging what you're doing. So keep doing it. So I feel pretty lucky. Well, well <laughs> I, mean, you, I don't see too much hair up there. Man, that's called stress. Is it? It's called bad genes. My dad's bald. So that's called ge bad genes and stress. I mean, you know, coaching these girls, man, it, it drive you crazy. Kamal, can I tell you, that, and this isn't, I know you're going to get mad at me for turning the tables back on you, but to see what you're doing in the inner cities and what you've done in Chicago for for underprivileged kids who normally wouldn't have an opportunity to, to play a, a very expensive sport. I think you're one of the coolest guys in the world. And I hope that people realize what you do uh, instead of just sitting in a, in a seat in a box at a tennis tournament, coaching a player to a final. There's a lot more to come out than I think people realize. Oh man, let me tell you. Number one, thank you. Number two, shoot me. If I had to do it all over again, I can't promise that I would because it would be most stressful. I mean, being being a black person trying to break into this sport who didn't play on tour, right? If you played on tour, you won a Grand Slam, whatever, you're grandfathered into the club. Uh, but coming where I come from, it's pretty hard. Even having the credentials that I have, it's still hard. Right. Um, but it's fun. And, you know, I like sort of, getting inside the club now and trying to make a way for others. I've got several of my students who now work on tour for other players. That's cool. Right? Uh, one of my, one of my students works for Naomi Osaka, right? Good job referral, having a good time. Nice. Went with her to a new agency. So that's going well. So that that's good off of a trust and a recommendation. Right. And so I value those opportunities to seeing, you know, kids come up in this, in this city, this neighborhood, and then be able to get them to, you know, into tennis other than playing, right? Because it's only for the truly gifted that right. can actually make money on the court, on television. So my last question for you is, you are a professional at this, right? From your work with TC, from the announce, announcing, there's so many opportunities for tennis players, collegiate tennis players to stay in the game, even though they probably aren't good enough to make it on tour. Even me, when I first did uh, my first stint at TC, and I did, you know, the play-by-play, -play, the commentating. I was like, damn, there's an art to this, right? And I'm not good at it, right? And I was like, you start to respect sort of the art form and not just somebody picking up a microphone and being good at it and being funny. What piece of advice can you give to tennis people who want to get a job in tennis, perhaps not on the court, but behind the microphone or behind the camera or even production? Okay, so I think you need to, to have people in your life who are honest with you about what your strengths and your weaknesses are, right? So, you know, back in the day, if we we're watching these, like American Idol, for example, right? And a kid comes on and says, you know, everyone says I'm the best singer in the whole world. And then they get on the show and they can't carry a tune and they've become the joke of the season, right? Uh, you have to understand what you're good at. 
you have to understand and, and being open and honest and having that conversation is not an easy thing to do. I know what I'm good at. I know what I'm not good at. I would never pretend, right? I, I'm not good at color commentating or, or play by play. I don't have that skill set. Uh, I know that I, uh, I'm a funny guy. I was able to make a living by my humor. I know that I love tennis and I know that I love and understand the passion of a fan who wants to be at a tournament. So I know my lanes, right? You've got to find your lane, find what you're passionate at, find what you're good at and what you're willing to change and learn to get better at. And there's so many different avenues in our sport where there's room for, uh, for things to do. I'll give you an example of, of a guy who uh, I think he played college uh, Phil Dorr, who's head of marketing at the Indian Wells tournament, played college, probably an excellent tennis player, but I, I'm, I'm guessing, I don't know him well enough to say this, might not been as good enough to go pro. So he went into tennis as a career and went to work for the ATP, whatever, it, wherever he has landed, whatever he did, he's now head of marketing for the Indian Wells tournament, for the BNP Paribas Open tournament. So he's taken a love for tennis and was an excellent player, but maybe not good enough to be a professional player. And now he's found another area in the sport to be at the top of his game to market the most prestigious tournament on tour. And you look around at our colleagues who we work with, and there are a lot of them. You take a look at uh, Donna Kelso, who's a WTA supervisor. She was a former player. Or you look at, at Pam Whitecross. Pam used to play professional tennis. And you look at all these people who have figured out what can I do to stay in a sport that I eat, drink, and sleep, uh, but can't maybe do it the way that I wanted to, but let me find another way to do it. That's our job in life, I think, is to find a career and a job that we, you know, it could be two o'clock in the morning and I'm in the middle of Doha, Qatar, homesick and having anxieties, but I have to stop and say to myself, you know what, shut up. You're getting paid to watch Sloan Stevens play Kim Kleisters in a tennis match. Like, like, what are you thinking? Like, shut up and enjoy the ride and find out what you're good at. And there are so many, listen, whether it's in finance or whether it's in production, we have huge amounts of jobs in production. Kamal, you can be a stage manager. You can be, uh, you can, there's 25 different jobs in production where you can run video clips and run playback clips and, and you can create the words that get written on the bottom of a television screen. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can be a director, a producer, an editor. There's a million skill sets that you can apply towards a sport that you love. And there's tons of opportunities to do it. And I'll, I'll talk to anybody about it. I love it. I'm, I'm the luckiest guy in the whole world. The thing that gets to me is when a 20 year old thinks that they have a skill set that they don't and they don't want to hear advice. That to me is the frustrating part. And as old, the older I'm getting, I lose a little bit of patience with that. I'm like, I wish I was a little more patient with that kind of uh, <laughs> mindset. But there are lots of opportunities in our sport, Kamal, as you'll be one to tell, for sure. Well, uh, you've been very patient with me. I appreciate your time. I always enjoy seeing you on site because, you know, you, you need a friend that's gonna be kind. You need to, you know, you need to know the music's gonna be up to par. I always love it when we're like in an empty stadium and I'm looking for entertainment and the changeover comes and it's like some Justin Bieber song that you chose. Secret, I love Justin Bieber. So I don't mind those Bieber songs. <laughs> but I thank you for spending so much time with us. You're this a believer. Been, huh? You're a believer. I love it. Oh. I didn't know you were a believer. Oh man, Acapulco 2016, I fell in love with Bieber. There you go. That was like my first, I didn't even know it was him. It was, can you say, I'm sorry, whatever it is. And, and he loves tennis. That's my favorite thing. When we find out stars that love our sport and we can do the crossover, that to me is, that's like the icing on the cake. I was at, uh, you, what's her name? Mariska Hargitay, who plays Olivia Benson on Law and Order. Uh -huh. I was at Labor Cup in Boston last year and I'm sitting in the, you know, on the, I'm sitting courtside and I turn around like this to stretch a little bit and literally right behind me, is Mariska Hargitay. I'm like, are you kidding me? I, I fanned out completely. And <laughs> I love when I find big stars that love our sport. Like Gladys Knight loves tennis. And uh, you know, you, you see who's at these tennis tournaments. And it's, it's fun when you, we see stars and we who make the crossover. Justin Bieber loves tennis, by the way. And it's fun when you're there for the, from the start to finish. 
So yeah. I, I thank you for your time, Andrew. This has been the Tennis.com podcast. Uh, I'm your host, Kamal Murray, and we've had the privilege of being with the voice of tennis, Andrew Krasny. Kamal, I want to say thank you to the A-list and the B-list celebrity who canceled on you, so I got <laughs> you today. <laughs> Yeah, you know, you're on my standby list. And I was like, right, who can I call? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Thank you, the you best. brother. Well, anytime. All right. Love you, brother. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, buddy. Love you, too. Be good.